Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of the Edinburgh Northern Cockrell Cast, uh, father and son special this time. Uh, so first up is a hard-running northern centre of the 90s, ageing like a fine wine into a slick fly hat. That's on my the beach, by the way, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a gents captain in more recent times. His teammates were always worried about that first tackle he made, often exiting the game early. However, if he survived that, he'd likely spill blood for the cause, and plenty of it, I'm told. He claims sporting talent skipped a generation, which may explain why he found his own expressed wearing the old gold and navy hoops in the Scottish East Regional Divisions. He is, of course, Ian McCann. Welcome, Ian. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And yourselves? Excellent, Pat. All right, good. Um, <clears throat> that was an excellent introduction there, Jason. Um, we're also delighted to be joined by your son, Ross, um, who currently represents the Scotland uh, national side on the International Seventh Circuit, which makes you our first proper international, uh, with no offence to Kit and Jeremy, who have been on so far. Um, your success hasn't just been uh, limited to the smaller version of the game, as you're also a former under-20 Scotland international who played at the 2017 World Championship in Georgia, alongside current internationals, uh, Darcy Graham and Blair Kinghorn uh, scoring two tries in the process. Um, how are you, Ross? Yeah, I'm all right. Actually, just uh, chugging along in um, isolation, keeping myself busy and stuff. But yeah, there's quite a few um, boys came out of that under 20s group. Do you remember? Yeah, when you came. What well, right when you're that northern? Pole, I did actually. Yeah, no, that, that was that was a weekend from hell to go to Tbilisi to watch one game of rugby, get <laughs> blind drunk, end up eating an overcooked and overpriced steak and drinking a bottle of Georgian red wine on my own in the middle of Tbilisi Square, uh, only to fly back the next day and miss my flight in Kiev. Still be Australia, though. <laughs> uh, was, was, it, was just, it was just awful. Uh, but we did see New Zealand absolutely hammer England in the oh, final, yeah, so it was always... 65 yeah. or something, wasn't it? Yeah, they had that mad hooker, do you remember? Oh, yeah, he was fast in most of our team. Yeah, <laughs> certainly fast in most of Northern, anyway. But <laughs> fast in the... <laughs> most, people, most, most people are, let's be fair. <laughs> Brilliant. So... First day, lads, what have we got to drink? Uh, we've got, well, I've got a Hop House 13 lager. Ross, do you want them? No, I'm all right. I've got nothing in a minute. Oh. I had a... Body's a temple, boys. Oh. Yeah, that, <laughs> that'll be it. <laughs> Glad you said that, Ian, because uh, as I'm on the Edmund Northern High Performance Programme, I've got a look at eight sport. Uh, Michael? Uh, I'm not on the High Performance Programme, so I've got a Peroni. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I had a bit of a disaster about, about 10 minutes before we came on here and I went into the kitchen fridge to have a look at what beer had been left from the, the weekend and the boys hammering it and there was not a drop left in the house. You shouldn't leave it unattended. Oh, bloody right. <laughs> Lock it up. <laughs> Don't protect, protect your drink, isn't that the rules? Yeah, yeah. So, so much for athletes. Eh? <laughs> you didn't protect your drink. Yeah, I wish you'd run to the, the, the bar as fast. Anyway. <laughs> So, other than your, your uh, drink situation, Ian, how, uh, talk us through your lockdown situation then. How are you managing? Well, it's fine. I mean, we, we've, not, we've not been furloughed because we just, we just uh, went off to working from home. And for the last 10 weeks, I've been basically keeping the boys out of the, the playroom and away from the Xbox, which I think is all right with the older ones. But Scott, who's 13, is completely doing his nut when it comes to about 5 o'clock, half 5 in the afternoon, and he still hasn't been on the Xbox. Um, I have had him playing behind me on a couple of meetings, but I've managed to sort of um, hide with the backgrounds, but it's the swearing and shouting that sort of gives it away. Is that you? Is no, that's me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's, it's been fine. I think we'll, we'll be quite a long time before we go by because office workers, we, we can just all work from home. I mean, how's, how's it with you guys then as well? well? I think Michael appreciates that. I mean, I'm furloughed uh, in the house building industry, so don't think they're expecting the market will, will kick back off anything uh, soon. We'll see though, possibly end of summer, uh, might need me again, Michael. Yeah, and I've been, I work for the government in health, so it's possibly the busiest I've ever been at work. Um, oh, I was so, going to say. Yeah, which has been, it's been a really good challenge, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit different. <clears throat> and obviously with the sun and stuff and kind of seeing everyone moving around when I've still got five hours to go on my shift, you know, it's not, not ideal, but we're getting there. Bit by bit. Yeah, that, that is the one advantage of working from home is that your your coffee breaks can be taken outside in the sunshine. Very true. <laughs> Very true. And Ross, if you took us through yours as well. Yeah, we're followed as well. So um, 
obviously we don't don't need to be training at the minute, so we're just chugging on by chugging on by ourselves. So but you are doing you are doing quite a lot of training though. Just I mean, keeping yourself fit. I mean, it's the same as if we had a summer holiday. You know, all that, all that, we're not sure when our season's going to start again. So it could be anywhere from September up until next January. So we're just waiting to see um, yeah. what happens, what when World Rugby decides when we're allowed to play again. Obviously, with the football starting again, it's good because it means that we're one step. I'm closer. just going to shut that curtains up yeah. back a second. Just one step closer to us, um, us playing again. So we'll wait and see. It's just boring training by yourself. To be honest, I'm not really used to it. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so your family recently featured in an article by the Times. Uh, well done for getting a little note in for ENRFC there. Uh, but oh, that- I, I, I did my best with that one just to make sure that we got <laughs> we got something out of it. I wasn't getting paid for it, so I had to get something out of it. <laughs> but that uh, that must have been a slow news day then. Uh, family of six from Edinburgh talk about what they do for a living. <laughs> well, I mean. Given, given the fact that, well, I mean, two of them, one of them plays in the SPL and the other one plays in the Championship, so it's not really big news anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, as, as I, was talk, I was talking to Paul Forsyth about it, and he just said, like, you know, apart from um, Anne Budge and Mondes, endlessly moaning about being relegated for being crap all season, um, you know, the, the only thing that they really had to talk about was something like that. And I think, I think they, they, they picked it as a, a bit of a sort of, a cheery story rather than people being furloughed and you know the other crap that's going on it is quite um it is quite a rare feat to uh, feat um to have three sons who've obviously represented their country at age group level uh, what's the secret i think uh, for all what was it there? you want me to say good parenting don't you i do actually um, there's, <laughs> there's a tenor on its way to you if you do no <laughs> they're both on <busy>, oh, your <laughs> flat <laughs> I paid it today. No, it's just like we've always just enjoyed what we're doing, especially like myself, Ali, and Lewis. Obviously, Scott's still um, playing and just doing what he doing what he enjoys. So the main thing is just for us having having fun. You know, like for myself, playing sevens, it's not a very lucrative uh, sport. So you have to be enjoy. You have to enjoy it. Ali's at St Johnson and Lewis is at Dunfermline, and it's hardly lucrative. I'm still better than sevens. Oh, maybe here. Yeah. Pay pennies. I'll be get make more money begging. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, you know when, the, when the boys were growing up, we just let them play their sports and they just sort of picked at it, didn't you? I mean, you just, you weren't, you weren't pushed, you weren't hothoused, we weren't shouting abuse at you for, well, <clears throat> usually in the house, yes, but we weren't shouting abuse at you about like sport. Two way shouting abuse at each other. Yeah, that's true. But. Uh, no, so yeah, no, it was good. Just, we all just tried whatever we wanted to. There's a load of swimming, a load of anything really like if you wanted to try it you tried it and then if you enjoyed it you enjoyed it Ali and Lewis played rugby as well Lewis didn't quite take to it as much as Ali did but well I think he did actually I mean Lewis was surprisingly good up until he broke his leg he'd still be good in that yeah but uh, that fat guy hadn't sat on him at Murrayfield these things happen yeah should go either way <laughs> um no no it's good it's just enjoyable it's enjoyment the main thing isn't it that's the only thing mm-hmm. you really say is if you're not going to go well in something if you're not going to enjoy it so well, I mean, as well with the boys, when when we, you know, I put so many miles on the cars just going to watch them. But you go, you go to these games, and you see some parents who are just so over the top, you know, shouting abuse at players, shouting abuse at their own kids, shouting abuse at the referee, shouting abuse at. But well, you remember that that game that we went to, your last football game for Hutchie, we went down to that Leith game, and the parents started fighting each other. No, it was the under sixteens. You got in the car and said, "I'm that's it. I'm never playing football again." Yeah, because yeah, no, no, there's I was, a different I, reason for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I was standing, beside, <laughs> I was standing beside the parents, and a fight broke out amongst the Leith parents. They're fighting each other. That's amazing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so we'll go into the kind of the, 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 the main body of the questions. There, we'll start with you. Ian. Um, do you want to touch on your backstory, kind of where you're from, your working career, and um, obviously talk to me about your family and kind of how you came to Edinburgh, I suppose. Well, I mean, um, I'm from Northern Ireland, obviously. Um, the accent is a bit of a sort of giveaway, even though I've been over here since basically 1985. Um, I came over in 85, went to St Andrews, played univer- university rugby up at St Andrews, then went abroad for a couple of years, came back, uh, and came back up here to do a, a law degree. And I, I started playing for the uh, Edinburgh University Law Society, and I bumped into some guys down in Valleith Park one Thursday night, when a guy called Dave Tiller, who used to be a member of Edinburgh Northern as well, and I were down playing football. I think it was John Olden we got talking to. And John said, oh, do you fancy coming to play rugby? So we said, ah, fine, you know. So we came along the next Tuesday 
on Thursday, which I think was probably the only time in my 30 odd years I've been at Northern Ireland. She trained twice in a week. Um, but I don't know, I was a lot younger there. But um, and I just got just got into the club like that. And once you, once you get dragged into something like Northern, it's very difficult to get away from it. Sounds like you're trying to get away from it. Oh, I'm not trying to get away. You've <laughs> been trying to retire for the last like, 20 years. I know I've been trying to retire <laughs> for the last 20 years, but you know the reason for retiring every sort of five years is I get a really good piss up. You like the attention. Yeah, so. exactly. Excellent. And really the same question to Ross, then it'd be slightly different, I suppose. Yeah, just uh, I was born in Edinburgh. I started playing rugby and my dad took me to Curry Minis just in that two years. I played there for three oh, years. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Three yeah. years or so. Three years or so, and then I started playing football again and then kicked around doing that and played rugby when I came back up to high school and just uh, really enjoyed it. Got involved with the Scottish age grade stuff under 16s. Um, it was actually about 14 you started being dragged off to that stuff down and then... Um, dragged off, I'd enjoy that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It was good for us as well because we used to dump you when we went back to see my parents in Ireland. Exactly, we had to fly back again. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so it was really good. Did the Scotland under 16 stuff, uh, 18s, 19s, 20s and then... On to seven stuff, so playing for various clubs. I went to New Zealand as well, so I played, played for five clubs now. So, Raw High Cougars when I left school. Uh, we were Raw High, um, Raw High School now. And then um, Sumner when I went to New Zealand, Stuart's Melville, Melrose, Scotland Sevens, and Scotland Age Grade stuff. So, quite a lot of different teams along the way. It just I've, I've enjoyed every single one, so mm. I've, not been, I've been very lucky with the clubs I've been to. I just really enjoyed it. So. Um, yeah, I mean, when I, when I was back in Ireland, I played for, I started at, at Portadown mini rugby years ago at James Park. And then when I went to school, I played for Dungannon for a while. Um, and then when I came over here, I sort of like, I played, played, played for a while down in England. I played for a team called Tunisians, who are based down in Twickenham. But just on the back of Twickenham Stadium, there's a, as you go down towards the stoop, there's a school there. There's a, there's a playing field and we used to play there which was hell on the days of rugby internationals because you had to spend half an hour getting all the bloody Land Rovers off the pitch before you could actually get one to play a fucking game of rugby. Excellent. Um, we've actually got our first listener question. I know you just touched on the Seven Circuit, Ross. Um, do you have a favourite kind of stop off on the Seven Circuit? Uh, yeah. Um, Cape Town and Vancouver would be my two favourites. Uh, just because for Cape Town, the tournament's amazing. There's like... Stadium's the old World Cup stadium, the football stadium. So mm -hmm. there's about, I think it was 50,000 people, 60,000 people there. And then Vancouver's just amazing. The indoor stadium, uh, 75,000 people in there. It's just loud and the pitch is terrible. The pitch rips you to shreds. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, you just all get cut up with that. It's you? terrible. You have like, you've seen boys with like pads all over their elbows and knees and stuff trying to stop themselves from getting cut like four times a day. So one of the boys was cut down to the bone once from an astral burn, so. But they're my favourite places. Just Cape Town's amazing. Just the stuff around it. My first year there, we went. We had one day off, and we went round, um, went on a tour of the vineyards, and had like a nice lunch and stuff. Mm -hmm. like that. And then went shooting in the afternoon with a guy called Andreas Strauss, who used to play for Edinburgh. So he sorted us out, and then played in the tournament, which was obviously it's an incredible place. And then Vancouver as well. It's just uh, Whistler, Whistler Mountain, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Just all the snow. I mean, it's a bit wet, but other than that, it's just an amazing city. I never get to go to these places if I didn't play seven, so made the most of it when you're there. Yeah, so. completely. It's quite quite interesting. You, you obviously touched on how loud it is, and I think myself and Jason and your dad probably the most we've ever played in front of was probably about 100 or 150. Is it <laughs> is it that <laughs> different? But, but, but if Breakin's in that crowd, it's a loud crowd. That's very true, and I have been some of the worst heckling I've ever actually had was from Norvin's uh, fan base. And is it that different to play in that kind of environment? You know, do you notice it? Does it give you a rise? Obviously, with all the the football at the moment behind closed doors, it can seem a bit stale and stuff. Does the crowd add that? Do you feel? Kind of? uh, I, it's hard because see with the sevens, I've never played in front of a massive crowd at home. I imagine if you're the home team, it makes a huge amount of difference. It's very different. Like we played England in. Cape Town this uh, this uh, year and everyone wanted us to beat England so it was like being the home team um, so that was incredible it does make a lot of difference just having the crowd there and stuff but people have been playing in front of no crowds for their whole lives so I can't imagine if you're a professional footballer playing for Borussia Dortmund earning £30,000 a minute it doesn't mm -hmm. matter you know yeah. I mean you're, you're going to play football anyway aren't you? and you're going to be true. good at it true 
So Ross, you've, you've obviously not yet progressed to the East Regional Leagues, um, but we're interested <laughs> um, to hear how your dad learned about the best club ever. I know you touched on it briefly then, but when was that and, and, and how again? That was 1992, I think it was. It, was, it would have been so August 1992, because it would have been just before I started into my university uh, year, so before me. Oh, yeah, long yeah. before you. Right. Um, long. Well, it wasn't long, <laughs> it was a few, a few years before I'd met your mum, so it was, it, it was quite a while. But yeah, I mean, so that, that's, that's, that's when I played my first game for Edinburgh Northern was August 1992. And I've, I've managed to play at least one game every season since then. You play this season? Not yet. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. It's done. I yeah. might be better. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's done. It's done. <laughs> Damn it. There you go. Damn it. I've, 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 broken, I've broken the streak this year. Can I Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a bad old run. I can retire, so, I can retire again. Excellent. <laughs> um, and obviously, a, a table of shame. <laughs> obviously, that's quite a long time. Ross, do you remember Norvin as a kid, kind of coming down to watch your dad and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I only really remember you playing for the Jets, yeah. to be honest. The main, my main memory is watching Dad play against Duncan Hodge in the 10. Oh, and he Jesus. Lost, he tore your whole team, he tore the whole team Do you apart. have to bring that up? Yeah, I mean, it was an embarrassing It was. Uh, it was worse <laughs> for Dave Rowney, do you remember? Yeah, he was bad. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my main memory. And then playing against um, that team from Wigan as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I remember that. We, we, had, we had a team from Wigan contacted us. And said, "Do you fancy playing a game? We're coming up. Um, you know, we, we've not played a lot of rugby union. Do you fancy a game?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. I'll be coming, boys." So they came up, and they absolutely spanked the shit out of us. Yes, yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the guys hit me so hard I thought I was dead. And I was standing in the standing in the clubhouse afterwards, and they'd set up their 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 court with all their sort of stuff on it. And I was I was standing chatting to one of the guys, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, we haven't played a lot of union, but." You know, a few of the guys that played rugby league. I said, all right, yeah, who did they play for? He went, well, he played for Wigan. He played for St. Helens. He played for Witness. He played for... And those two over there, they just played played for Great Britain last year. I said, Jesus Christ. It was very, very noticeable <laughs> how good they actually were. Well, I've never seen a team get slaughtered like that before. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the best one was, though, we, we had this Spanish team came over when... Um, when, when Dave was in charge, um, the, the captain before me, and Dave's, Dave's pretty much talk was, don't worry about it, guys. They're Spanish. They won't have played a lot of rugby. They're over here to get pissed for the weekend. And I thought, all right, fine, no worries. You know, so I was, I was playing stand. Well, I say playing standoff. I was sort of standing in the 10 position for that game. And their number eight picked up the ball and ran at me. And I thought, well, he's running a bit fast for somebody who doesn't know a lot about rugby. <laughs> And as I tackled him, he flipped the ball on a back pass out of his back to their, to their blindside winger who had just come in and scored under the post. And I turned around to Dave and said, right, we're for it. And it turned out that a good chunk of them had played for Spain in the World Cup in 1999. Spain are good, I can tell you that for a fact. Spain, oh, just... Spain are very good. They've beaten us a couple of times, actually. They're... Yeah, but, but, that, but that's the trouble with the gents. You, know, you, you don't know what you're going to get from one week to the next. I mean, you, you can get some absolute shockers of teams who, who can barely, you know, catch a ball. And generally, that's us. And then you've got some, some brilliant guys who are, you know, recently retired and they just want to have a laugh. Some, some, of the French, yeah, yeah. some of the French teams were like that. You know, they had a mixture of, like, really, really old guys or really good guys who'd, who'd retired. I mean, I know that's why we ended up having to sort of bring so many young players into it and just pretend you're over, over 35. <laughs> So, uh, so I I played my first game at Northern uh, with Ian, uh, I think 2006 against Bigger or possibly Stumel. Anyway, a team that lacked the back row, so I just lurked inside the in all game, waiting for that pass inside. Uh, you would have been working for a long time. <laughs> yeah, <you'd already> <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so I came away thinking, well, I don't rugby isn't all that difficult then, uh, but Ian, <laughs> in, in, in your experience in Northern, what would you say is our unique selling point? I think the great thing I've always found about Northern is that, I mean, it's a bit trite, but it, it just takes anybody, you know, and you, you can always get a game at Northern and you're always welcome, no matter, no matter how good you are, or how crap you are. 
you know, if you, if you just buy into the ethos of the club, you know, you, you, you turn up, you, you try for your 80 minutes, you have a drink, you have a chat, everything's, everything's about a laugh, you know, it, but it, it, there's, a, there's a serious undercurrent to it, you know, about just playing well for the club. I mean, when I started at Northern, we had five teams. We had a fifth. That's you know, nice. and, you know, and, you know, to be fair, that, that just dropped off and dropped off and dropped off. And it, it wasn't because there wasn't interest at Northern. It was just we couldn't get games. Okay. You know, the, the fifths couldn't get a game anymore. And then, then they get bored and they go away. But, you know, you guys have all, you've, you've all been in the, you know, you've been in the clubhouse as well after a game. You know, especially, you know, if you've got a, a visiting team who decide to stay. You know, and it, 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 becomes, it becomes wonderful. I mean, we, we, had, we had a guy um, played for us in about oh, 93, 94. I think it was. He, he was a, a Maori, a guy called Andy Prance uh, came across. And Andy was a complete wired to the moon lunatic. Brilliant guy, brilliant guy, but just mad as buggery. And he would do a hack out to himself before we'd go out on the pitch. And Andy, Andy, I saw Andy get the... the the, the quickest red card I think I've ever seen out with my corner by tackling by tackling someone so badly in the first 30 seconds of a game the referee had to send him off because Andy was so so fired up but Andy Andy came from um, Canterbury and he, he played you know decent rugby over there and he phoned the SRU when he turned up in 93-94 and he said look I've played for Canterbury I've played in the Ranfurly Shield I've done this done that who should I play for over here? And they said, and he, they said oh, you need to go to Watson's, Aki's, Burnmue or something like that. He said, well, to be honest with you, I'm just over here to get pissed and have a laugh. And the SRU said, well, you want to go to Edinburgh Northern? That would be the main selling point, I would say. I mean, just, I mean, obviously I was very young and stuff, but I would always say the social aspect of the club and something that's, I can imagine now, because I've coached um, a wee bit of Raw High, just here and there, doing little bits and being to watch them play and, um, just staying around the club, but I would say that they haven't lost that social aspect, which is easy to do. I mean, now it's easy to just be, to try and be amazing and be mm. world beaters and try and be the All Blacks, but um, you can, I mean, you just haven't lost that social aspect, but I think quite a bit. But there's a lot of good players, you know, it, it's not just a bunch of social players not, wobbling, I've, wobbling I've, around I've the not, pitch. I've not seen them that long. So yeah, I've been down for a few years. <laughs> I watched Royal High play them a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's not that's not that's not sort of indicative. <laughs> Quite right. Um, well, I, I I completely agree with the social element. I think that's what made me want to play and um, take my rugby a bit less seriously. Um, we'll move on to the pitch. Actually, we'll back onto the pitch. And um, the first question to you, Ross: Do you have a kind of favourite kind of victory, you know, maybe a season or a tournament in your career that stands out in your memory, or, or a couple, perhaps? Uh, I've got a couple. Uh, when I was at school, we went on tour to South Africa. Um, with, and that was just a really enjoyable experience. Um, something that school hadn't done for 50, 60 odd years. Or something like that. Had they ever done that? Yeah, they did back when they were good. Right. Um, and then um, just my season with Melrose, where we won the league in the cup, that was just an incredible season. Just ups and downs and stuff and stuff that was going on. Just every season I've had with the Sevens as well, you get to experience new things. I mean, you get to play against some incredible players and some good blokes and then some terrible blokes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then you get to play against some terrible blokes, but uh, you know, it's good and bad with everything. And then <laughs> who's who's the worst and most annoying sevens player you've played against? Sorry, I know you're meant to ask the question. No, that's a great no, we're open to oh, uh, to participant questions. <laughs> that's uh, excellent. Uh, there's a lot there's a lot of players who um you can't you won't name names because Do you want to name countries? No. <laughs> I won't name countries either, but there's players who are uh, You don't want to trump that, do you? No. Right, there's okay, wind up wind up <laughs> merchants. Uh on the circuit, there's certain wind-up merchants, there's certain people who uh, play the play the game really well, and who are very good at getting what they want from. Yeah, they're very very good. And then, but but then my under twenties, obviously, the amazing experience in Georgia, just to beat. Oh, if we'd be, if we'd, we had a try disallowed against New Zealand, mm. and if we'd scored that try, we would have been in the semi-finals to play England, to play in the final against New Zealand, which would, I mean, we wouldn't have won it, but. You know, it would have been cool. <laughs> you did beat Ireland, which annoyed me. Easily, as yeah. well. We beat Ireland, beat Ireland, beat Italy, beat Wales, beat Australia to come fifth overall. So it was the highest places that a 20s team has finished. So that was an amazing place. But couldn't really celebrate because you weren't allowed outside the hotel. Otherwise, you'd probably get kidnapped. 
<laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a bit wild. It was scary. It was yeah. Scary for us. I yeah, actually, no. I, I think I remember watching that Australia game actually. Um, on yeah, we'd been on Facebook actually. Um, did you not score against Ireland, or am I imagining that? Yeah, I did. Yeah, uh, well, you say that Darcy Graham ran ninety percent. I, yeah, I, 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 I was going to I was going to say Dar- <laughs> Darcy did all the hard Darcy work. Darcy Stafford, yeah. Staff, yeah. Stafford McDowell caught the ball, did an amazing out the back offload. Darcy ran the length of the pitch, got tap tackled, popped out to me, dived over the line, and took all the glory. So, I mean, I was there so, for the but, photograph. To be fair, that's what centres are meant to do. I was there for the photograph. Yeah. You let you let the wingers do all the hard really work, a and then you just <laughs> pop up at the end and take the glory. I wasn't really a centre. Yeah, got moved into the centre because we had a couple of injuries coming out of the New Zealand game, and they're just like, come on, yeah, they're the best, best of a bad bunch. But plus, they had Robbie Nairn and they had um, Darcy. And Blair. And Blair yeah. was the back three, so yeah. They were all, yeah, we're all pros now, so not a bad bad bunch. Hmm. Yeah. I, I completely agree with your dad, but they're all statistics at the end of tries. It doesn't matter when you're looking back <laughs> in the record books. As someone who's mainly scored from five meters out. Um <laughs> so uh, to yourself, Ian, do you have any kind of favourite victories or memories of playing at Northern that stand out for yourself? I've 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 got quite a lot actually. Um I mean there there's some some great games we've played. Um, there's, there's a couple that particularly stand out. It's one in my first season. Um, we we won the uh, the championship that year and got promoted to the national leagues. But we had we, we lost our first game uh, largely because we were down 14 men for 79 and a half minutes of that game uh, after one of our props got sent off for stamping on somebody. Uh, no names, no pack drill, Mike. Um, but we. Uh, we we sort of we, we recovered for the rest of that season. We got we got to the end of the season. And I, I think we had to play. I think it was Edinburgh Uni in the last game. We had to beat them, and their pitches w- w- weren't playable. So we said, oh, you know, come down to ours. You know, we'll, we'll we'll play you at ours anyway." So we we beat them six three, and it was. I know I know it sounds appalling, but it was one of the tensest games I think I've ever played. And we we had an Irish guy playing fullback called Phil Leonard. He was a fantastic fullback, um, absolutely brilliant, brilliant rugby player. But he he could kick from anywhere, and he he just he you know he kicked the the six points that day. And every time they punted the ball at him, he just caught it, punted them straight back into their corner. That was a wonderful, wonderful game. I was drunk for about four days after that. That's like Evan Fraser Thompson, isn't it? So, yeah, it's Thompson. Yeah. He's about the same age as you, isn't he? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there were the, the the other one that that stands out for me is going up to play. I think it was Penny Cook. We went up to play uh, for the seconds, and again it was a game we had to win, and we played it in a blinding snowstorm. And honestly, I've never seen a game played like it in my life. And we played the first half into the snowstorm, um, and we managed to we managed to get half time nil nil. And then in the second half, um, we were playing with the snow behind us, and it was a complete whiteout. I mean, you couldn't see the lines or anything. And I remember getting the ball and punting it long, so I was playing standoff, and that's what standoffs did in the snow. And somehow John Alden beat everybody else to the ball in the corner. And I've no idea how Johnny did this, but it must have been held up in the snow and everybody else must have been held up. But he slid in and scored it under the posts and I managed to get it over. And we beat them by, beat them by two points. And that was enough to keep us up that year. And that, was, that was a fantastic game. Now, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the best in the world, but it was the fact that the snowstorm was blinding everything. Talking of snowstorms, we played Hoyt. Do you remember the year we won the league? We played Hoyke and we had eleven boys away at the club club fifteen. So absolutely blizzard snow. There's like boys away playing for Edinburgh, boys away playing for Club Fifteen. We went down and we lost thirty three three away at Hoyke as a Melrose team. It was the worst experience of my life. Blinding snow. I couldn't even see the other end of the pitch. Had to like there was water breaks and they were bringing on cups of tea to warm your hands up and then run them back <laughs> off. And they just absolutely slaughtered us. I don't know, like they had to win the they had to win the game to stay up, and yeah, they they won the game. <laughs> this is pumped up. Yeah. I've never played in a game like that before. I couldn't couldn't even see by the no, end of the, the game. The, the, the coldest game I've ever played in was about nineteen eighty three, eighty four. We went up to play Reedy and Dowd in a school school game, and we had to walk the pitch to crack the ice beforehand. And I was playing on the wing, and I I literally had to be carried off at the end of the game. <laughs> all got all got no further than than our standoff. It was ju- it was just awful, but yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you've thought off in the bunker, Ian, have you any memories of of favourite nights out that you've been on with Northern then? No, I have lost all memories of favourite nights out in the, in in the bunker. 
He woke yeah. up in the bush once. Yeah, no, that was, no, 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 that was funny. Actually. That, that, that was that was that was the time I officially officially retired from the seconds. And uh, my mate Dave Rowney, who lives up the street, and actually played for, played from played against me when he was at Methody. And um, I persuaded him to come out of retirement. And we were playing football against Ali and Lewis and you actually at David Lloyd. And Ali was about I don't know, Ali must have been about nine or ten. So Ali decided to not make Dave, and Dave, as he tried to turn and kick a nine-year-old, ten-year-old kid in the air, snapped his knee and didn't actually get to play. But um, Dave, Dave's, a, Dave's a doctor at Sick Kids, so he managed to get um, old wooden crutches for the day down at Northern, you know, the old sort of kiddies ones. And when he turned up at the start of the day, you know, he was, he was on these crutches, he couldn't move. By the end of the day, he was running around like no problem at all because we had instigated the, the table of shame. And I don't know if you guys have ever been dragged into that. It's it's the it's the port drinking table. Every uh, time you every time you sit down, you have to buy a bottle of port and you can't leave it until the bottle of port's gone. Is that individually or is it just but Well, no matter how many people are sitting at the table of shame, if you sit down, the bottle of port has to be bought, everybody has to buy a bottle of port and it all they all have to be drunk. It's that's terrific. A, that sounds incredibly dangerous. It's absolutely horrific. It was banned for a long time after somebody fell in the pond. Um, was it you? No, it wasn't me. Um, I could tell you who it was, but I'm not. Um, can't remember. <laughs> no, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, but we got we got back here, and uh, I sort of shoved Dave Rowney in through the door, and he did one of those sort of three stooges things where he ran round and round on the floor and couldn't get up, uh, and apparently decorated, redecorated their ensuite bathroom in a lovely sheet of vermilion that night. But it's a it's a hundred yard walk from their house to ours down a hill, and it took me an hour and a half because I sat down at some point with my rucksack on my back and fell backwards into a hedge and couldn't get out of it. It wasn't an hour and a half. It was the next morning. No, no, it was an hour and a half. It's an hour and a half because, because Dave Ronnie's wife is standing at one end of the street shouting at Joe, saying that he's left. Where is he? And all I could see was my feet sticking out of the hedge. Oh, fantastic. Um, I suppose we, we can't ask you about the best night out at Northern uh, yet, Ross. Um, but what's, what's, the, um, what's the social scene like in the seven cell? Do you get to go out for... A piss up in that, or is it kind of depends, more rip? Petty. Depends when your flight is. Um, every now and again, get, so the way they do it is there's always a flight at like nine in the morning the next morning. So someone has to leave the, the hotel at six in the morning. So you sort of draw a loss with it. I don't, I don't know how they do it, but it always ends up being us leaving at six in the morning. So uh, you do it every now and again. We've had some good ones. The better ones, have, uh, yeah, some of the good ones I've had with Melrose have been amazing. Mm. Uh, incredible. The one where the pub golf for the guy fell over at Greyfriars Bobby. I've just had a memory of you in the gimp suit from <laughs> uh, gimp suit from uh, Stu Mill. Do you not remember the? It wasn't gimp suit. It was an elf's costume. All oh, right. <laughs> it was an elf's costume. Yeah, but it wasn't it, a gimp suit. But it, but it was one of those skin type. No, it wasn't. It was it just was, small. We we <laughs> we got a phone call about two hours after the game finished to come and pick you up. Yeah, you didn't know your name. You didn't know where you were. I didn't know where I was. I was in the back of the car. Yeah, you were. <laughs> it's a good job they called us before we got too drunk. But yeah, anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I've had a few. Uh, I had a couple where I was away in New Zealand as well that you really can't name names for certain people are sitting. Like we had a double denim night, and there's one of the boys wore a, a denim jacket with a fur hood. And this was my leaving night, so it got pretty rowdy. Halfway through the night, he's fallen asleep. So one of the boys decided to see if his uh, fur was flammable. So he set fire to his hood. He's running out into the middle of the street and uh, a certain all black was driving past and he uh, managed to put him out with a water bottle as he was driving past and a certain quite famous all black right. who flies helicopters now. Okay, right, fair enough. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, certain things like that. There's other ones where we had a pub golf where we paid for 20 of us to show up and only four of us showed up. Um, so we are getting a picture of Greyfriars Bobby the four of us standing around and uh, eventually we turn around there's only three of us standing when the picture is actually taken and there's a picture uh, there's like a cluster of four pictures getting taken the guy standing like that and eventually just turns and just falls straight on his face <laughs> the other way around so there's quite a few like that that was unbelievable but of course all that's behind you now that's a professional athlete yeah yeah okay certain professional athletes have had bad influences on me as well who have uh Remember when I woke up on the front step? Oh, yeah. Pre-New Year. Mm -hmm. yeah, we yeah. had a New Year's Eve Eve 
night out with uh, one, a couple of my mates and uh, I got back quite early in the morning and I couldn't get in because I couldn't get the key in the lock. So I fell asleep on the front step and I woke up with dad kicking me off the front step. I thought that was quite impressive that you didn't actually start banging the door that night. I think I fell asleep. Yeah, I think you probably did. Then, yeah, then Ali drove the car into the front of the house. Yeah, that's another <laughs> story. Let's skip over that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on swiftly. Yeah, well, there's actually, actually, actually a story about Ali, the, the, our, our second boy. So we were doing uh, some work on the house uh, in December 1999, and we got Ali Blackall to come and give us a quote. And shortly after we got the quote, Joe went into labour and had a child. So I don't know whether it was the quote that Ali gave us actually pushed her into labour. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've heard you make that joke. I know. It's, I know. A fair, it's one of his set anecdotes yeah. that he has that goes down every time. But then, of course, you know, we, we named Ali Ali, so, you know, who knows? <laughs> so, uh, let's go on to, in, in, obviously, in your time, you've played centre and, and standoff. You, you choose then, but who would you most have enjoyed playing alongside, being a nine or a ten, and then outside you? Well, I've played... That's the right answer here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've played with a number of nines. Um, the, the best nine I ever played with was a guy called Ian Howell. He was there in our first couple of years. Ian, Ian was a fantastic, fantastic nine. Um, and he was there when I made the transition from, from 12 to 10, which was really useful. Because actually my first, my first game was against Stu Mel Thirds as a 10 when Finley Calder was playing uh, back row for them. That was that, that was not that was not an easy that was down in the old pitch at Gypsy Bray, that that was not an easy uh, introduction to playing ten. Um, the worst nine I've ever ever played with is Kenny Telford. Are you going to offend him? Yeah. The, no, it's, it's, it's one of one of the gents. Kenny, <laughs> Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Telford has played number nine a nine on a few occasions, and honestly, you spent you know most of the game in something like that as the ball flies over your head. Or like that, as it scrabbles around your feet, or behind you, as it's just, just awful. The best, best ten I ever played with as a centre was a guy called George Shaw, played for us for a few years. And I don't know, don't know if you guys have ever met met George. Um, I don't think he's been down at the club for a long time. But George had a very sort of loose way of playing. He, he could almost play like he was playing in slippers, and a smoking jacket, and a, and a cigarette. And he, he was just fantastic. He, he, he made it look effortless. Wonderful, wonderful player. Um, best centre I ever played with. Um, I, play, I played with a few good centres. I mean, Tony Morrison was a really good centre. But the great thing about Tony was that he always made me look slim. So I was really happy with that. Uh, Derek Smith was another great centre. But the best centre I ever played with was a guy called uh, Dave Soda in my first year. And, and Dave was another one of these guys who would just glide around the pitch. And the first, the first time I ever met Dave was on the pitch two minutes before kickoff because he just turned up late for a game. And I thought, oh, you know, the, the, we, we were in a state of panic and because that was our, my first season that we lost our first game and we were up playing Dick Vett at Pepper Mill. And I thought, oh, we're going to get slaughtered. And Dave sort of turned up and he was just fantastic. So I think it, 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 if I had to pick the best player I've ever played with at Northern, it would be, it would be Dave Soder. Fantastic. And the same to you, Ross, obviously we've touched on a couple of the boys who came through your age group stuff. Do you have a maybe a favourite player that you've played with or um, kind of yeah, positional I've got, partner? I've got a few. Like uh, When I was away, uh, I played with a, a 9 out of 10 called Tom Ziolo and Nick Cummins, who are unbelievable players in their own right. And then a couple of boys like can, like Puasa Wakinabao, who uh, ended up playing for Canterbury, who's a big Fijian guy, and Nathan Earl who played for England now, so he's played, he was unbelievable. I've never seen someone who could just catch, catch the ball on the backfield and he would just take off. Never seen anything like it. Uh, a couple of other boys, Marshall Suckling, played for Sumner. Uh, but over here, I'd probably say, I've had loads. Like, just for sheer grit, I'd say Scott Riddell as well, obviously the seven, seven stall war. Mm. I mean, mm. I've never seen a man who is so slow be so good at seven. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'd say it to his face as well. He's an unbelievable sevens player. I've never seen anything like it. I, the amount of stuff that he could get through in one game was for someone who was 
coming to the end of his career, I reckon he could have easily played another couple of seasons. Easily. But was he captain last year? Uh, no. Robin Fonzo. Robin Fonzo. But uh, different different players for different reasons as well. Fraser Thompson at Melrose, you like Fraser. Oh, he's, he's a great player. Fraser was wonderful, Fraser wonderful was a great fullback to play with because his boot was so like, he could kick it eighty meters mm. easily, but he could also run it back eighty meters if he wanted to. He was so quick. I mean some of the tries he scored, I remember one against Watson's went eight nine and just ran it give it to Fraz and he ran round um He's called like DJ Innes or something for Watsonians. He's a very good defender in his own right, and he just skinned him like he wasn't even there. Just ran it in at the corner. I've never seen anything like it. But oh, the list goes on. Like I could probably name ninety percent of the players I've played with for different reasons. <laughs> uh, Nick McCashin at Stu Mel as well. The ten played for the Hurricanes. The same reason he was just a, mm. came and played casually, but he tore his ACL like three games into the season. So that was a bit of a. Ali Gregg as well for being one of the best blokes. That would be one. <laughs> Worst That's hairline, best bloke. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite actually, I've got a wee anecdote about Scott Adele myself. Uh, he coached a session with um, the Scottish Parliament team uh, out at Murrayfield, um, and I caught an intercept off him, um, which I think is the only time I'm ever going to do that, and I broke away and remembered who it was who was chasing me down. And I just thought, I mean, you said he's slow, obviously, but I'm not exactly lightning. And I just thought there's absolutely no point. There is no point in running this. And I just stopped uh, and waited for the touch and moved it on. But uh, that was frightening having a... Uh, he'd, only, uh, he'd only just retired, actually, and having a you know a sevens player chasing you down. I, I knew that battle was over quite quickly. So. Yeah, he'll chase you all the way as well, even if he's not going to catch you. He's, he's not going to yeah. give up. It's one of the most annoying things is if you make a break, you know... A Scott, Scott Riddell or Niall Godsmark as well is going to chase you all the way back. You're going to have to score it right in the corner because you know that they're going to be running down the middle of the pitch. And no one's fat. Well, there's a couple of Carl Niles and that will run it in, but myself, I'm not going to be running around people to score. <laughs> Fantastic. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've got a final couple of listener questions then. Uh, yeah, fire away. Yeah. <clears throat> so these are both for, for you, Ian. So sorry, Ross, about this. Um, so the, the first one is from. Uh, Grant Town Prop, um, and he asks, Does Ali fancy joining the Dons? <laughs> you can tell Greg, Craig Lawson there's no chance. No, he might. <laughs> he might, actually. Mike he might. Kennedy did it. That's true. That's yeah. true. That, that's... And then Ali half did. Yeah, that, Ali that, tried to break his leg. That was pretty brutal. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did, I, I did post that um, goal uh, Ali scored against uh, the Dons just to annoy Craig again. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate tagging him. I did tag him in it as well, but I, 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 got, I got no response from that, strangely. Yeah, strange. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, it's the whole Scottish football thing's a wee bit up in the air. I mean, I mean Ali's got a three and a half year contract at St. Johnson. He's enjoying it. Mm. But it's a bit weird having lost Tommy, uh, Tommy Wright. So we'll just mm. see what, what comes with that. I mean, they, they, they actually ended up having a fantastic season. Yeah, they've come I mean, sixth now overall. Yeah. Cause I mean, having gone from you know, sort of relegation certainties in November to finishing sixth in the league. It's, it's astonishing. Yeah, I've had a good turnaround. Uh, it's been good to watch as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I don't support a Scottish football team. I'm a Sunderland fan, so I like rubbish football. So, I mean... I was going to say, what do you know about football? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's been great to see Ali, Ali do well this year. And Lewis as well at Dunfermline. Like, for someone so young, I've never seen him. He's doing really, really well. I mean, both yeah. of them being incredible yeah. this year. I think Lewis won Young Player of the Year, and Ali would have won Young Player of the Year if the season had finished. Well, I mean, they're, they're still at it because yeah. he's, he's um, in the running for sports writers, young player of yeah, the year. Yeah, Edward will win that. No, it's not. It's got to be Scottish. It's, uh, Is it? Oh, he might do, yeah. It's Ferguson, Ali, uh, Hickey, and your man Campbell from Hamilton Aggies. Oh, he's good. Yeah. Lewis, Lewis Ferguson will probably win. Yeah, probably. Yeah. They're both in really, like, there's, sorry, there's a lot of good young players in Scotland. I mean, I'm not a football yeah. expert. So I mean, I'm not going to suggest there's any sort of Rangers bias at all in that. He's not a Rangers player. He's not, but <laughs> Barry's. But, Barry's his uncle and Derek's his dad. He's still not a Rangers player. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, he's 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 not a Rangers player yet. Yeah. I think is the is the best is the best way to describe that. Yeah, um, was, was there not talk about him going to Celtic though? I don't know if that would go down very well in his family. I think. Um, yeah, I think he might, a, might struggle with that one. He's a good footballer, though. The same as well for Ali, and um, you know, kept around. He's kind of had a breakthrough season, which I was quite impressed by, obviously, because you see it flash up and stuff. So. Uh, on your feed on Facebook, um, so it's fantastic for him. Um, so the next question is from Andy Marsbar, um, which is on a scale of one to ten, how angry were you with me 
when I threw the ball out of play with only a slight lead towards the end of your final game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unbelievably, because it meant that they got a penalty and kicked and we could have lost. Oh, honestly, honest. I, I, I I'd forgot, I'd, I'd forgotten about that. I think I remember. Completely <laughs> forgotten about that. I think I was apoplectic. <laughs> <laughs> with with Mar at that one, <clears throat> yeah, he does. I mean, it, it's it's not usual for Andy to to deliberately throw the ball into touch, accidentally on on a regular basis to chuck the ball into touch. Yes, yeah, but at least he actually passes it. Yeah, I've so. never seen a crash ball ten before. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 it was it was no problem with Northern. It worked well. <laughs> yeah, really yeah. well. <laughs> Why so? <laughs> Yeah, he does actually say in his, uh, his kind of wee comment afterwards, he did think that you were going to kill him. So, which is um, <clears throat> a nice relief that you didn't. I think I'd be yellow carded in that game as well. I wouldn't surprise me. Oh, no, I would actually. I'm not seeing you. Yeah, it wasn't me though. I can't remember who it was. It was some, some flanker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the point. My, my, my first ever game was Edinburgh North and I ended up playing as a flanker. It was a pre-season warm-up against Leith. Yeah, they must have been struggling. They were. I, mean, I ended up. I ended up um, slashing my chin open by being headbutted by somebody from the back row on Leith and having it stitched up on the side of the pitch by a vet who happened to be standing there. Oh, Funny, that's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it meant it meant I could go straight into the clubhouse and have a drink after. <laughs> I didn't have to go to minor injuries. That was a trick. Let's just do the shot. Do the shot, yeah. <laughs> Before we round up then, just tell us what you're most looking forward to when life returns to normal, uh, Ross first. Oh, I just, well, you sh- I should probably say getting back to training. Um, yeah, you should. I will say that as well, because it is, um, it's pretty boring just training by yourself, and I've not really had this much time off in the last five years or something, so it was nice for the first couple of weeks, but now I'm pretty sick of it, and I just want to get back into training, but different things, like just being able to do anything. Like go to the cinema with my missus and stuff like that. I mean, can't even. We were sitting in the back, sitting in the back garden yesterday. We had a Mrs. roast. Jake, Molly like that. Yeah, Mrs. Molly. No, fair um, yeah, there's little things like that. Like, I mean, yesterday we had a Sunday dinner, and me and Molly had to sit in the back garden, and they sat inside at the table. You need to put that into background. She lives down in Melrose, so we were socially distancing. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. we, you could have sat next to the door, but you chose to sit us in the middle of the garden. Yeah, well. <laughs> Yeah, we like Molly. <laughs> <laughs> it's another recycled joke. It's not. Yeah, it's not only Mum says that one. No, it's not. <laughs> and Ian, other than getting rid of Ross, uh, what are you most looking forward to? <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things I am looking forward to when it all sort of eases up is going back to watch the boys play again. <sighs> you don't watch. You don't come to watch me play. Yeah, but you travel around the world. <laughs> I mean, if you right, back off, right? Play in London last year. Yeah, well. <laughs> We didn't get a chance to go down. So, uh, it is one of the things that I've missed is not going to see the boys play live. You know, our, our Saturday afternoons do sort of tend to be taken up. Um, well, Saturday mornings tend to be watching you on Sky. At two in the morning. At two in the morning. <laughs> and then Saturday afternoon, either going up to Perth or going across to Dunfermline, depending on who's drawing the, that, whatever particular straw. Scott as well. Scott, Scott as well, Scott but that's, that, that's on a Sunday as well. So it's be, usually got rugby Saturday morning. Yeah. So. It'd, be, it'd be good to get back into that habit again. Man. And again, one of the, one of the other things I'm looking forward to is just actually getting down to the club and having a pint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> possibly, yeah. Put, possibly even putting on a pair. Of, I'm not saying run around. I'm just saying putting on a pair. Of boots. Be careful there. Oh no, careful. my age. <laughs> I don't so, even thanks. know if I'm insured properly. <laughs> well, lads, thank you. Uh, so join us next time in the Cockrell Cast when we speak or return to the front rowers and speak with uh, Tom Horton. But for now, I'm Jason Thompson. He's Michael Maudsley. And thanks to Ross and Ian for joining us. Stay safe and we hope you're back doing what you both do very best very soon. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers.